Uh, my name is Caleb, if I haven't met you yet, and I get to serve as a student pastor here. I think it's the best job in the church, um, and we're just excited to be able to be here with you guys this morning. I'm gonna start with a little story, okay? Once upon a time, there's a man born into a family, and this family is pretty religious, okay? They follow a lot of different rules, and he starts to learn, okay, these are the different rules. These are the holy scriptures of my family, my religion. These are the things I'm supposed to do, the things I'm not supposed to do. He tries his best as he starts getting older, right, to love God, to love his parents. Uh, and his, his parents actually have a family business, so they're fishermen. So just like his dad before him, just like his granddad before him, he gets into the family business of fishing, and pretty soon, as a young adult, he meets a woman, they get married, he's starting a family. That's a pretty typical story, right? I mean, outside of a fisherman in central Indiana. Uh, if that's anyone here, you should try something else. But this guy, he's, he's a pretty normal person in his life. He does a lot of things that he's known for that are pretty incredible. He does some things in his life that he's known for that are pretty rough. And just like all of us, this man was given a name when he was born. Now, for those of you who are parents in the room, I have to assume that it's pretty daunting to try to name a child, yes? Because you have to think about all of the potential nicknames, right? Think about all those like middle school kids. What are they possibly gonna say that's gonna twist this to make it weird? Are, are the initials gonna be weird? Like, what does it rhyme with? You gotta make sure this is, this is a pretty permanent thing, right? Someone's name sticks with them throughout their life. They might change hobbies, schools, locations, jobs, friends. Their name stays the same. Right? I would argue a name is, is one of the more permanent things about us. You following with me? Now, now, this person I was talking about, this man, the name that his parents gave him when he was born was Simon. His first name, it has a meaning, right? It, it means someone who listens, someone who hears, okay? Ironically, Simon doesn't turn out to be someone who listens or hears very much in his life. Now, his last name, his surname, like all of us, we have those, was Bar Jonah, which means son of Jonah. Now, you'll have to forgive my handwriting. I'm of the generation that was only taught cursive in school to get to the point where we didn't write anything at all. We just started typing. So this is all you got. Hopefully that's legible. That's gonna be there for a bit this morning, right? This is his name. This is who he is. He is Simon, someone who hears or listens, Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. And as he went into his life as an established fisherman, as someone who was starting a family, he became someone who was known for a lot of things. He was pretty fiery tempered, quick to talk, quick to act, right? That was his superpower, but it was also his kryptonite. And I, I said names can be pretty permanent, those of you who are paying a lot of attention, uh, I've actually used a permanent marker, a Sharpie, on a whiteboard, which is like the number one no-no, right? Like, because when you use a Sharpie on a whiteboard, nothing happens when you try to erase it because names are pretty permanent, right? This piece of our identity, this piece of who we are is significant in life. And oftentimes in life, more than just our names, we have certain things about us that feel pretty permanent. And sometimes when we look back in hindsight at things in our life, we say, man, I wish I would have done that differently because now, if we're honest, I mean, it's never gonna change. I am who I am. Now I've got certain addictions and habits that I go back to. Now my thought life, well, it always goes down the same rabbit trails at 3 a.m. when I wake up and it's pretty dark. Now I'm the parent who can never support my family like I wanted. Now I'm the kid who could never live up to expectations and my childhood is gone, so that's gonna be who I am. We have pieces of our identity that if we're honest, we treat like they're permanent. Now, the older you get, uh, to quote uh, Kay in the announcements for you old <clears throat> people out there, uh, the older you get, biology actually says it's harder for you to change. Did you know that? Like the way that your brain functions and works. That's why great grandma Gertrude, right, sits there in a rocking chair and says, ah, it's all the same as it always has been. And you're like, well, not exactly Gertrude. Uh, this is called an iPhone. This is how you use it, right? But she's resistant to change. We have phrases for that, right? Can't teach an old dog new tricks. You hear things like, well, you better get used to it. Things like, well, it will never change. Or you are who you are. And the more we experience life, the more we start to believe, I 
will never change. And so my initial question for you this morning, would you be willing to engage with me? Ask yourself, do you actually believe you can change? Can I change? Can I change those thought patterns? Can those addictions start to change? Can my relationships become less toxic? Can I become a different mother or father or spouse or son or daughter or friend? Can those things transform in my life? And what I wanna address here this morning isn't just something that I'm up here as a pastor to preach at you. This is something that I have been spending time with, that the Lord has been pressing in to me. Can I still change? I'm, I'm someone who, uh, if you just want a quick overview, I, I'm someone who loves people. I'm a huge extrovert, right? If you want to try to use the Enneagram, I would be a two in the Enneagram. I love people. I love a lot of things with people, but something that I have dealt with my whole life is trying to please and serve other people in order to be loved or in order to be wanted or needed, right? If I can help someone else, then I'm worthy of being their friend. If I can be there for them, then it's not just a good friend, that's who I am to them. That and other things in my life, after decades and decades of living, sometimes it's still the same struggles. And I ask myself, like, am I actually capable of changing some of these patterns? And as the Lord has consistently been working on that, he has also brought the same story from scripture into my life through conversations with Ken, through things like my huddle on a Wednesday morning, through things even like The Chosen, right? It's, it's a show and there were directors and producers who took this same passage of scripture and put their own interpretation and understanding of what it looks like into an actual visual representation. And I have continued to see God speaking to me about this passage over and over again. But before we get there, I do want you to know, right, as a student takeover weekend, that I am incredibly proud of our students, of our leaders, and of the family ministry from kids all the way up to adults here in this church. And we see amazing things happening on this stage, and we get to go in and see our kids. But I hope that you know there are incredible adult leaders who step in to engage and lead and disciple your kids like it's a job that they work. But I promise you, a lot of them are in it because of the way that they care and love for your children. And so here at Mercy Road, we value families. We, we believe that when families win, we all win. And so there are actually two brand new things that I just wanna make sure you're aware of that we have launched. One is a parent hub. It's on the website. You'll find it on the website or if you wanna check that out now, it's a screenshot and a QR code. Um, this is a place where currently you've got a lot of different things for Mercy Kids. It talks about what they're teaching, what it is going on right now. You can look at that to be able to ask them questions on the way home. Hey, what verses are you talking about? On the right half of the screen, you've got the Family Ministry Outpost, a brand new outpost that is designed because we want to equip you as parents. We want to give you community as parents. We want to show up with you and alongside you as parents and begin to do some different things. So October 6th is the first event for that. You'll see that if you go there for any information. Um, we're gonna get together, eat some food, have some fun, introduce that a little bit. We'd love to have you join us there. Now, we're gonna go to Matthew chapter 16 together. So if you have your Bible and you wanna open that, feel free. If you wanna power on your Bible on the Bible app on your phone, feel free. If you wanna follow along, I'll have it on the screens here in a moment. And while you're getting there, right, this question that we're addressing is, who am I? Am I the same person I've always been? Am I capable of changing? Or do I have to believe the lies that say I am who I am and I've gotta deal with it? This morning, it's, it's kind of a mini case study, if you will, on this man, Simon Barjona. He was a disciple of Jesus, okay, a follower of Jesus. Some of you who know your Bible know that we actually know him better as Peter, right, not Simon. And we're gonna get to that today, right? The guy with two names, Simon Peter. He was likely the oldest of all the disciples, okay? We know this uh, because he was probably someone who was looked at as a bit of a leader amongst this group of guys. He was someone who was married, right? I said he's established, he's got this career path, he's someone who's doing the family business, he's got a brother, younger brother, who's also in this with him. He's someone who's a different stage of life than the rest of these disciples. And yet, when Jesus says, hey, you should come follow me, he says, okay. He steps in to follow. Now, let's dive, in, dive into this together. We're gonna go to Matthew 16. We're starting in verse 13. I'm just gonna read through verse 20, all right? 
says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, right? Not your own brain, logic, mind. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Now, I read a passage like this and I have some questions. Right, as I'm going through that, we're talking about binding and loosing. That's not exactly common vocab in my world today. What is he binding? What is he loosing? Why is it heaven and earth? He calls him Simon Peter, then he calls him Peter. What's up with that? What's up with the name change in here? He starts the passage by saying they're going to Caesarea Philippi. Does that matter? Why is he saying where they are? Why does geography come into this? And why is Jesus finishing this whole thing by saying, good job, you know who I am. Now be really quiet about it. Right, he says, don't tell anybody. And I want you to know, when you read the Bible and you have questions, that doesn't make you a bad Christian. That's actually how you engage with scripture, right? You read, you think about the things you don't understand and you ask God, you ask others, you look it up and you ask God to say, God, help me understand what this means. And that's all that we're gonna do this morning with this passage, okay? So it starts by saying they went to Caesarea Philippi. Now, I've got a quick map here for those of you uh, geography nerds out there. You're welcome. This, this is important because Jesus was somewhere near the north part of the Sea of Galilee, okay? So kind of near Bethsaida there. And he decided to go all the way north. This is like 30 miles in nasty sandals. We don't have cars, planes, trains, motorcycles. They are walking all the way there. That's a couple days journey. And after this is over, We know that the next thing that happens is Jesus goes so far south, he goes south further than the Sea of Galilee. So he said, we're gonna go all the way up here. I'm gonna take you out of the way because there's something in Caesarea Philippi you need to see, right? Does that make sense? That's kind of what we're seeing as we start this passage. And the reason this is important is because of what they find when they get there. There's one more picture here. And this is kind of a rendering of what it may have looked like the disciples would have been incredibly uncomfortable when they got to Caesarea Philippi. In fact, this might be one of the last places any good religious Jew would ever want to go. And Jesus says, "Uh, uh, that's where we're going. There's something different about Jesus because this would have been known as the gates to Hades. Culturally in that time, Greeks would have believed this was where the gates to the underworld were held, the gates of hell, the God Pan, they worshiped here, right? There was a spring that came out, a cave that went in. They would have been incredibly uncomfortable. And it was their friend, their leader, Jesus, who chose to make them uncomfortable by leading them here. This is a big deal. I can't think of a time that my close friends intentionally choose to make me uncomfortable. Like, have you ever gotten in the car with one of your buddies? And he's like, all right, here we go. I'm just gonna surprise you. And he drives up to like the place where your ex is still working. And he's like, this is gonna be hilarious. You should go inside. Be like, no, what? No, I'm not doing this. (laughs) You're a bad friend. Or you get in the car with one of your girlfriends and she's like, hey, let's go to that toxic work environment where you got fired and it wrecked your whole life. Let's go there and say hi to everybody. Uh, No, thanks, right? I'm trying to put that behind me. We don't make each other uncomfortable, but Jesus here intentionally makes his friends uncomfortable. What I want all of us to understand here this morning is if you find yourself uncomfortable, on edge, a little bit precarious this morning, you're in a place that you don't really like, I believe Jesus is ready. You are primed to hear from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He's ready to teach you something this morning. Jesus doesn't leave us comfortable. So before he says a word, everyone's on edge. And he asks his followers, hey, who do other people say that I am? And they kind of answer him, right? They're kind of flattering. These really big name prophets out there, they're like, oh, you're kind of like this guy or you're this guy. But like normal, his disciples, they're trying to follow him, but they can't quite track with Jesus. 
And so he says, all right, forget everybody else. Who is it that you say I am? Who do you say I am? Jesus gets real serious. He looks him in the eye. He says, forget that person next to you. Forget your spouse. Forget everybody else. Forget what the pastor says on Sunday mornings. Who do you think I am? He stops them because the truth is this. You don't get to coast by on other people's opinions of Christianity. You don't get to ride the coattails of everyone else's prayers and care and love for Jesus. It's not how it works. You don't happen into freedom with Jesus just by proxy. That's not the way that anything permanent ever gets changed. You don't get to just be near someone and hope that, man, the parts of you that feel permanent and ingrained are gonna change in your life. That's not how it happens. And the one who answers Jesus when Jesus is looking him in the eye is this man, Simon, right? I said, he speaks pretty quickly. In this moment, it's a good thing. He speaks up and says, I know who you are. You're the Christ, the Messiah. You're the one, you're the answer. You're the person, you're the savior. You're the one we've been waiting for. And in this moment, right, this is one of the superpower moments for him. Jesus looks at him and I love this because I think this is one of the biggest moments in this guy's entire life and we get to see it. We get to be a part of this. When Jesus looks at him and goes, yes, you are blessed for that. It wasn't even you. That's so far beyond. It's not even your brain. It's you listening to the Holy Spirit communicate that this is who I am. I believe that this is significant so significant actually that Jesus says, yeah, you were Simon, but now you're Peter. They would have probably been speaking Aramaic and then this is written in Greek and in both of those languages, it doesn't matter. Peter is similar to rock, right? Like think Rocky Balboa, think Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right? Peter's gotta be feeling pretty good about himself in this moment. That's right, all right, Jesus, I'm the rock. Like this is a huge moment in his life. He answers significantly. There, there are some people who would interpret this passage in a few ways. If, if maybe you grew up traditional Catholic, Catholics would say that when Jesus says on this rock, he means Peter. And, and so they would say, Peter, he was the first Pope, right? He was the one who the foundation of the church was built on. Others would say, Jesus is saying, what did he say? He said, Jesus is the Messiah. It's on him that the church is built, Right? There are different interpretations of that specific sentence, but regardless of where you land on that, we know, we see consistently in scripture, Jesus says he's the cornerstone. He's the main building block, right? If you're building Lego towers, he's the one that if you take it out, everything comes crumbling down because there's nothing left. And it's that statement that changes Peter's whole life. It's the beginning of a new life for Simon or Peter right? And I can imagine maybe other people around him, disciples, other people in his life, if not, they're speaking this, they're at least thinking this internally. Simon? Simon, the guy who's like supposed to listen to you and doesn't listen to anyone. Simon, the one who uh, does a lot of things that we should not do. Simon, the one who, well, he's so rash later in his life, right? He said to have gone up and cut off someone's ear because he acted out of anger. This is the guy He's the rock. Okay, Jesus. Why does this change happen now? And why does Jesus choose him? This is really important this morning. I hope that you are with me because the reality is that Peter's finding of who he was called to be came through and from the moment that he fully recognized Jesus. How that translates for us is that we discover who we are when we discover who he is, right? We discover that about ourselves when we know who Jesus really is. Peter found who he was called to be when he finally saw Jesus as Jesus was. And you can find who you are really called to be. You just need to find Jesus as he already is. It doesn't happen when Peter first decides to follow Jesus even. Have you thought about that? He was already a follower. And yet he was Simon. That didn't change anything for him. It doesn't happen to you when you decide, oh, I finally found the one and I'm gonna get married. It doesn't happen to you 
when you finally have kids, when you finally hit that six-figure job. It doesn't happen to you when you check off any of the things in your life that maybe you've tried to check off, right? We can do a lot of things. We can show up to church. We can have perfect attendance. There's something else that makes this happen. And if we're honest, some of us, we just chase change for the sake of change, don't we? I wanna be better so that I'm better, so that it's not so hard. Do you chase change or do you chase Jesus? Because he's where that comes from. Chasing change alone doesn't change anything. Peter found the calling on his life the moment he fully saw Jesus for who he was. Have you seen Jesus for who he fully is yet? You've been known by your own name your whole life, right? You've got a a name, a nickname, right, a middle name. Some of you got a a weird nickname in college and for whatever reason you stuck with it, so that's that's great, right? We, We have different things we're called, but we also have those identities that we hold onto or things people have said about us, names that we've been referred to. Maybe you've been the one who lets people down, the child that honestly just could never live up to the expectations at home or you're the one who helps at all costs, like me. That's who I am. Or you strive to make others think you're the perfect parent, right? You got it together, screaming in the car, but then you get to the youth soccer game. All right, pull it together, people! Open the door. Ah, so good to see you today, Amy. I hope that you have a great, yeah, okay, yeah. We try hard, right? In this room, there's a lot of different stories, names, and identities but none of those matter when you show up and Jesus calls you by your new name and identity. We leave all of those behind. I hope you hear this. This is really good news. And what Jesus said to Simon, to Peter, right after he gave him his new name, he looked at all of his disciples and he said, listen, the gates of hell will not be able to stand against you. And this is where Caesarea Philippi is a big deal because guess what was directly behind Jesus while he was talking to them? The actual gates to the underworld. He took them there because he's saying, I understand this preach as well. I understand these are trite words. I understand that someone can get up and say something cool. You walk out inspired, but it's about more than that. He understands life is real. You leave and there are loved ones in the hospital. Your kids are driving you crazy. People that you love are hurt. There's a broken system of trying to invest in our children who need homes, right? Orphans, like we have a lot of brokenness in our world and Jesus sees that and he recognizes it. He knows that today in Fortville, Indiana, in Fishers, in Hamilton County, in Hancock County, it kind of feels like Caesarea Philippi sometimes. You hear things like, oh, the world's going to hell. This is hell on earth. We're on the highway to hell. Thank you, ACDC, what a song. Or you hear things like, it's never going to change. And we start to believe it. Jesus knows things are difficult, but when he says the gates of hell, you tell me, are gates offensive or defensive? They're defensive. He's not saying when hell comes knocking, you're gonna be able to survive. He's saying you're gonna go knocking and you're going to take hell down because the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus Christ can overcome all of it. But you're not doing it when you're living in your old name. That's not how it happens. He knows our life is an actual fight against hell. And a lot of Christians will sit back and just say pretty words, say fun things, and then move right along because we wish it wasn't. And it's a lot easier if we pretend following Jesus is gonna be perfect, easy, simple. But it's real, right? Let's take the reality and go out and charge the Caesarea Philippi that we find ourselves living in today. And if you know your gospels, you know that this guy named Simon, who got named Peter, who's the rock, goes on to mess up, doesn't he? A lot actually. Right before this, in Matthew chapter 14, he's the guy who walks on water with Jesus. One of two people, him and Jesus, who walk on water in scripture. Incredible. He only makes it halfway though. Then he falters and falls. The story that I just read was from Matthew 16, right? I stopped at verse 20. 
Let's go to literally the next verse, verse 21. You ready to read this with me? From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's getting it wrong. He goes from the rock to being addressed as Satan. Yikes. He's still in progress from a new name to that. And yet after that, he's still trying to figure it out. Jesus, he is being held captive. He is being beaten and tortured before his execution. And you know what what Peter does, the rock? He denies Jesus three times in a row. I don't even know the man. You can see that as discouraging, or you can see that as actually, this isn't a superhero movie, which is great because I'm not a superhero. My life is real. The truth about Jesus is that he turns people into who they aren't yet. He did that with Peter, and he'll do it with you. And we're actually able to see the beginnings of some of the fruit that happens. After the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are about Jesus's life, okay? The book of Acts comes next. It's the story of of what the church looks like when Jesus is gone. And in the second chapter, right at the beginning of the book, our man Peter is ready to preach a sermon. I just wanna read two verses from Acts 2, okay? This is Acts 2, verse 14 says this, but Peter, standing with the other 11 disciples, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give ear to my words. That's my Peter preaching voice, right? He, he goes on to give a whole sermon. And when he finishes, look at what verse 41 says, those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let's go, Peter. That's incredible, And after that, in Acts chapter 10, if you keep reading, he is one of the first. He receives a vision from the Holy Spirit to take salvation, not just to the Jews, to the elite, to the inside crowd, but to the the outside, to, to go out to the Gentiles, to everybody else. And he follows through with boldness. He works through the difficult conversations. He leads the way as the rock would. He is a changed man, but it did take time, right? Transformation, sanctification, which means Becoming more like Jesus is a process. It's not an overnight thing. I wish I could preach that, and I I could, right? I might even get some claps and amens, but it doesn't translate to real life. We're here to talk about the gospel and the way Jesus actually works, not the way that we think might sound nice. There's another apostle named Paul, and he's got some words that speak just to this process of life. In 2 Corinthians chapter three, it says this. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed, right? What's in front of us and keeping us is removed. Now where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces, beholding the goodness, the glory of the Lord are being transformed, sanctified, changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. See, when you turn to Jesus, you don't have to cover anything anymore. Things start to change, but it says one degree at a time. Right, imagine, this is Peter's life. When he is Simon, he is walking, he is trying, he's messing up. And he's named Peter, so he has a shift. That's one degree change. And yet he continues to mess up. And then he'll try to say, okay, Lord, how can I become more like you? And it's one degree change and a one degree change. And a one degree change translates to 180 degrees of change over time, right? That was years of Peter's life that we glance through as pages and say, oh, he's a new man. It took him time. It took him time to change. You can change, right? We we can try all kinds of different things to get us to change. We can try all kinds of different things and answers to try to break our habits or our addictions or the identities that we've held, the things that we think we are, who people have told us that we are our entire life growing up. But that does not actually translate to change unless we show up and we say, Jesus, I know who you are. 
When you look me in the eye, I can tell you who I am. And I know it's a process and it might take time and I'm gonna have to work and it's gonna go one degree after one degree after one degree. But I trust that you are going to tell me who I am, that you are going to give me a name, that you are going to call me, that you're going to begin to change and give me a clean slate in my life. It doesn't happen the way that we probably wish. It doesn't happen the way that we think we might actually be able to accomplish our our own. But it happens when you know who Jesus is and when you trust him for it. I'm gonna invite the band up right now, but as they're coming, I want you to listen well because these aren't just things I want you to hear. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you this morning. Jesus doesn't just offer change. Jesus, he requires it. He's he's so in love with you that he's unwilling to let you just sit in your brokenness. He's like, if you follow me, I'm going to make you uncomfortable and I'm going to look you in the eye and ask you the question, who do you think I am? You can answer that question right now or you can wait until eternity comes and it says in scripture, he will look at you and he will ask you. So you're answering now or you're answering later, who is Jesus? What is he capable of? What does he want to do in my life? And who does he say that I actually am? Because he has a different name for you. He had a different name for Simon. He said, yes, you might not have been a person who listened or heard, but you are going to be Peter and people will know you for all of history after this as the rock. He was new because he found Jesus and he knew who Jesus was. You have to figure out for yourself how to answer. It is true. We firmly believe and have seen that no one is too far from God to experience life change through Jesus. Peter had been following Jesus as a disciple, but he didn't have a new name yet. You might be following Jesus and showing up to church, doing different things. Have you received your new calling? I want us just to take one little step of action. Would you stand up right now? We're gonna finish praying together. I would love it if you stand and if you're comfortable, would you hold out your hands like this for two reasons. One, this is a posture of receiving, right? Lord, we receive who you tell us that we are, the name that you are giving us, and we believe we are capable of change. And the other thing is, this is surrender. Lord, I've got a name and a story, and people have told me I'm a certain kind of person, but I'm giving that up. And I'm not gonna try to do it on my own because it gets really tiring trying to erase what's permanent without Jesus, his life, death, his blood on the cross, his resurrection, his power for you. So would you pray a prayer for those with me? God, we come and we just ask that in this moment this morning, for those of us who have never actually said we will follow and commit and give up who we are to follow who you call us to be, this is the moment for us. Would you take all of the baggage and the weight and we know that it's gonna be one degree to another that some things will go faster and some of them will take years and years of surrendering and giving them up over and over again. God, help me not to be such a people pleaser. Would you take that from me and allow me to just please you and know I am accomplished in you through who you are, God. Take that and give us our new name. God, we are who you say that we are. We love you. We trust you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We say amen.